you would, to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. The book of Joshua, chapter 6. I want to speak to you this morning on lessons from a general. Lessons from a general. It was June the 24th, 1812. Napoleon had decided to attack Russia. It was called the Russia Campaign. 450,000 men began this campaign. As it began to drag out longer than what they anticipated, I thought the winters in Illinois were bad. My first winter here, December the 1st, 2006, it snowed two feet. But that was nothing compared to the winters that would hit Napoleon in his army. Little by little, between the cold, the winters, the snow, and then the starvation, and the freezing of his men, his campaign turned into an utter disaster. Of his 450,000 men, by the time he finished his campaign in retreat in December the 12th, in 1812, 380,000 of his men had died. I believe there were some lessons to be learned. But in Joshua chapter 1, we have some lessons from a general. His name is Joshua. He has met with the commander-in-chief. If you're there in chapter 6, look in chapter 5 and verse 14. And he meets this man with his sword in his hand and he wonders who this man is. He says, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. In other words, uh, I believe, as many scholars do, that this was a theophany, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. Even when Daniel failed to worship an angel, you remember in his historical account what took place in his life, the angel said, get up. Get up. And even John, when he uh, had an angel appear to him, he fell on his face. And the angel said, get up, get up. You only worship deity. We don't worship, worship angels. We don't worship men. We don't worship Mary. We worship God. Jehovah God. So here is his commander-in-chief giving him the orders. As they are to go into Jericho. And verse 1 says, And Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Now, I wish I could give you all the historical accounts and archaeological facts of what they've discovered. They, they can take you to Jericho to this day, the ancient city of Jericho. It was a double-walled city. The walls were 40, 50 feet high. Two walls. It had a spring inside and the supplies. The people could have lived for a long, long time. Shut up, as the Bible says. Watching these Israelites march around. 
Let them march. We don't care. We're okay. It was one of the most fortified cities in the land of Canaan. And strangely enough, God brings them to one of the hardest cities first. Jericho. It's interesting what they found excavating Jericho. They found the walls had collapsed, just like the Bible said. They found that inside Jericho there are jars filled with grain, burned. It must have been right after the harvest in the spring, as the Bible says it was. But there are many lessons to learn from this general Joshua as we look at his story. We can't help but think of the children's song, and the walls came tumbling down. The Lord told Joshua to go to Jericho and to march seven times around. So let's learn some lessons from this general. The first lesson is the formation of the Israelites. In other words, God had a plan. The commander-in-chief says to his general, this is the way you are to conquer this city. Joshua could say, God, it's an impossibility. And God would say, you just follow my plan. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I've given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Isn't it like our God? And tell us if we'll follow His commands, we'll find victory. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war. Go round about the city once. Thus thou shalt do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall come past the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, and all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straightway before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priest and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. In other words, God has a plan. And here's the plan that He told him. A portion of the army is to go before the Ark of the Covenant. Then there were to be seven priests with ram's horns. And then there were to be four priests that carried the Ark of the Covenant. You remember, only the Levites were to carry the Ark of the Covenant. It had poles that went through and the hooks on the end. And then the last portion of the army was to come in the rear. They were to march around Jericho once a day. Once a day. Now, we know according to the Bible there were some 600,000 men of war. 600,000. Now, Jericho was a pretty big city as far as Bible times. So here the people of Jericho are looking at what they think is this uh, shenanigans as they march around. And then on the seventh day, God said they were to blow the trumpets and they were to shout, and I'll give you the city. And God said the gold and the silver was to be taken, but everything else was to be burned. Everything was to be burned. Now again, when you follow God's plan, you know what archaeologists found when they excavated Jericho? 
they found that the walls that were on a, uh, a rampart had fallen. It was a double-walled city. And they found houses on some of the walls, on the outside walls. And as the walls fell outward, not, not inward, if they would have fallen inward, that would have been a problem. You know why? Because as the walls fell, these 40-foot walls, as they fell outward, archaeologists said it acted like steps. Exactly like the Bible said that the people of God came up, up the walls. Guess what else they found when they excavated Jericho? They found jars filled with grain. Now, that seems ridiculous to the world because an army coming in in the harvest in springtime, uh, that's the spoils of war. It's kind of like, here's, a, here's all the Kroger you want. All the food. You can make bread. You can eat. Here it is. It's all yours. But God said, nope. It's all to be burned. When you follow God's plan, and God has given you and I a plan, and when we follow God's plan, we find victory. God's given us a plan for the family. It's called one man and one woman for life. God's given us a plan how to raise children. He's given us His Word. This is your family guideline for your finances, for your family. He's given us a plan, and here it is. But see, when you make up your own definition of what a family is and how to raise kids, and you don't follow God's design, you won't find victory. It's true with the church. God's given us a plan for the church. Here it is, the blueprints, church. When you read our Constitution as a church, this is our blueprint, God's Word. And we don't go asking the world, well, how do you build a church? And what do you like? And, and what do you enjoy? And let the world tell us how to dress and how to do our music and, and, uh, how, and how and what to preach. Don't preach against sin. It makes people uncomfortable. Make people feel comfortable in church. Don't preach against sin. No, we have God's Word how to run a church, how to grow a church. Jesus said, I will build my church, not man. And you follow God's plan. You want to know how to get victory in your life? Follow God's plan. We heard about sin, what sin will do. Sin will take you further than you meant to go. It will keep you longer than you meant to stay. And it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. If you want victory in life, people are looking everywhere else for victory except God and His Word. Our victory in America is not in the White House, but in God's house. I've said time and time again. What we need is revival. A revival across this land. May it begin right here in a few weeks. And I would say, may it begin right now. Amen. God has a plan. Are you following it? If you're not, you're not going to get victory. You're going to be frustrated, aggravated, upset, turning to psychologists, to alcohol, drugs, entertainment, pleasure, and trying to get victory. But God has a plan. And God told Joshua, here's my plan. What was their purpose? Purpose was for victory. The army was to go first. And then right behind them were seven priests blowing ram's horns. Now, I have here this morning a small shofar. And that's the word that's used. A ram's horn. Now, maybe I could get Ken to play it, but I'm not going to play it. It will blow. But the ram's horns that these men had were a, a lot bigger. And a ram's horn is not real fancy. It's not like the silver trumpets that they had later in, in the uh, tabernacle and in the temple of Solomon. It's just, a, just an old plain horn. 
It doesn't make a beautiful sound as maybe Brother Ken uh, would play his trumpet and as he does on Sunday night, it makes some beautiful noise. Uh, no, ram's horn, I don't even know what key it is. I, I don't know anything about music. But it's not real beautiful. It's just... Ah. Seven. Seven priests, seven horns. The number seven is very significant in the Bible. And we could spend a whole message on speaking about sevens. It was on the seventh day that God rested. There were seven feast days for the people of Israel. Three of these feast days fell on the seventh month. There were seven weeks to Pentecost from Passover. The seven, seventh year was to be a sabbatical year. And seven Sabbaths, seven times seven is 49, uh, the 50th year was supposed to be the year of Jubilee when all the debts were wiped out. Seven. One commentator said, these trumpets were of the basis manner, dullest sound, and at least shown that the ex excellency of the power might be of God. That God takes the simple things of this world to confound the wise. God takes the simple things of this world to accomplish His will. Can you imagine the people in Jericho as they look down on these Israelites laughing and making fun and joking and doing all of those things as they march around. But God is teaching His people. And I believe God is teaching the Canaanites, the people in Jericho, a wonderful a lesson as well. The Bible says that it's the base things of the world and the things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, are. I sometimes feel like this ram's horn. Lord, I'm just simple. I'm just base. I, I, I'm not anything. And God says, that's the kind of folks I want to use. Sometimes it's not many mighty, not many noble. And why does God do that often? And Paul would, would tell us in Corinthians, you know why? He said uh, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Now again, God wants talent and ability. God wants gifted people. And, and shame on you that, that you don't use what you have for the glory of God. But oftentimes God says, I, I use people, everyday, common, ordinary people to accomplish victory in this world. The Ark of the Covenant came next. Some ten times the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned in the story. And we, of course we know what the Ark of the Covenant represents. It represents the presence of God. That it would be that God would use them through His presence. But understand, when you're looking at this Ark of the Covenant, I have a, a little Ark of the Covenant in my office. It, it's a little one. It's, it's not real gold. It's artificial. <laughs> but it's about yay big. And you see pictures, you know, uh, uh, Bible stories, uh, you know, them carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Well, that, that's wonderful. That's good. But understand that the Ark of the Covenant was covered up. It was covered. They took the curtains, laid over the Ark of the Covenant. They took the badger skins. And I got a whole message I, I'll preach to you. Uh, on those badger skins that they laid over the ark. So when the ark of the covenant was being carried, you know what it looked like? It wasn't that beautiful shining gold that was underneath it. It just looked plain. Covered up. Kind of reminds us what John said. And we beheld His glory as He tabernacled among us. 
God was in the flesh and he appeared like an ordinary man. You couldn't pick him out in a crowd. He didn't have a halo on his head. And his face didn't shine, but it did shine one day on the Mount of Transfiguration. As this human body allowed the glory of God to shine out of it. The presence of God. Victory was promised. But understand, it didn't come by their knowledge and their wit and their army and their know-how. But if you're still there in Joshua chapter 6, look in verse 10, if you would. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day that I bid you shout, then sh shall ye shout. Can you imagine that? Now we see that the flesh is put to silence. The first we saw the formation of God. This is my plan. And now God says the flesh is to be put to silence. Can you imagine 600,000 men might have been hard if it was 600,000 women <laughs> not saying a word for six days. Well, sorry, women, but women like to talk. That's okay. They talk more than men. You know, when a man, he says something, he just says, yeah, yeah, two or three words. But a woman, she's got to tell the details. You know, she tells you all the details. Well, that's okay. I'm glad we're different. But can you imagine that these men, 600,000 men of war and the priest, and God says, for six days, don't say a word. It's a test. Allow God to work. You see, we even find that suppressing the flesh is hard at times, isn't it? Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that the spirit in the flesh was he uses the word they're contrary one to another. It's like a wrestling match. As, as he tells us in Galatians uh, chapter 5, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are the contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. James tells us the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So, so God is saying to Israel, keep your mouth shut. It's not going to be you. And I believe God is saying to us sometimes, it's not you. It's me. It's not your words, it's not your works, it's not your genius, your know-how, but we must depend upon the Lord. And that old flesh sticks his ugly head up in our lives. Can you imagine they're walking along, these 600,000 soldiers, and, and they're carrying, uh, uh, they're going behind in front of the, uh, the army, and then the seven priests, and the Ark of the Covenant, and then the rest of the army. And one old guy starts to say, oh, and the other guy says, mm. They, they know the orders. So God is saying to us sometimes it's better to be still and know that I am God. It's a test of, of could we say, self-control, someone said. People who can't control their tongues can't control their bodies. In other words, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He says, James says this, For many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. The word perfect there means complete or mature. And able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. 
It's a test. Is that we would say, God is you. You know, the biggest problems I've often seen in my life have come from me. Me. Getting ahead of God, disobeying God, not waiting upon the Lord, but trying to help the Lord out. Just, just wait on the Lord. It's a test of obedience. Do it like I said, do it, God said to Joshua. In other words, the Bible tells us His ways are far above our ways. God would say to Saul, it is better to obey than the sacrifice. Even Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Isn't obeying God hard sometimes? It is. Obeying the Lord is hard. It's hard sometimes to pray. It's hard to sometimes to give when, when the finances are kind of low. It's hard to witness sometimes. And, and I find myself sometimes without a track and I say, Lord, I, I need to carry more tracks. I need to witness more. It's hard to be faithful to church, isn't it? I wish reading your Bible was easy. But you notice how the old flesh finds so many things to do and the world calls us and our schedules become so busy. It's hard to read God's Word. Obeying God is hard sometimes. Taking up your cross daily, Jesus said, and follow me. Obeying is better. But yet, uh, how sad that we just don't obey the Lord. And many a Christian find themselves in very difficult situations and they're not getting victory because they're not obeying God. But notice the foolishness of God is wiser than men. In chapter 6, verse 11, So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once. They came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose up early in the morning. The priest took up the ark of the Lord, seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord went on continually, and blew with the trumpets. And armed men went before them, and the reward came after the ark of the Lord, and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. The second day they can pass the city once, were turned into the camp, and so they did for six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, compassed the city the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! For the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Again, put yourself on the wall, one of those double walls surrounding Jericho, about 40, 50 foot high. You're looking down at these foolish Israelites. They're not saying anything. And they're marching one time a day, one time a day. And, and, and then they go back to their camp. And, and, and the people in Jericho are saying... Uh, they're not building siege towers. Uh, they're not building battering rams. Uh, they're not building ladders. Uh, there's no war engines. Uh, they're not even digging some kind of tunnel. They're just marching. Can you imagine the laughter? Can you imagine the ridicule? The Bible doesn't tell us all these things, but you know it's got to be going on. But God delights, as we read, in using the weak and seeming foolishness to defeat His enemies and glorify His name. It's no wonder that Paul tells us in Corinthians that the preaching of the gospel is to them that perish 
foolishness. Foolishness. You mean that God sent His only Son who lived a perfect sinless life, died on a cross, they crucified Him, and He rose again the third day, and all you have to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Is that it? Don't I have to do something? Don't I have to build something, go to church, give, get baptized, live a good life, uh, do all the... Uh, you can't be real. You can't, it can't be real. But Paul said the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You see, by obeying the gospel, salvation comes. The world looks at us and says, you go to what on Sunday? What, what about the ball game? What about the lake or the river? What about going to grandma's and, and going picnicking? And why not do this and that? Uh, you, you, you give your money to what? You mean they're having revival and they're having church how often? That's foolish. You got better things to do. The world looks at the gospel and says it's foolish. The world looks at what we're doing here this morning as foolish. But victory is coming. But God told them, you remember, in verse 18, And ye, if any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. And when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. The first fruits belong to God. You see, the word accursed means devoted. It according to Strong's, is a dedicated thing. Things which should have been utterly destroyed, appointed to utter destruction. In other words, it was appointed to destruction. The city, God said, will be accursed. It will be devoted for destruction. Ye shall take no spoils. And put all that resists to the sword. Well, what did that mean? You see, understand that God is teaching them the principle of the first fruits. The first belongs to God. When the Israelites brought the first of their crop, the feast of the first fruits, it belonged to God. Well, 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 what if I don't have any more rain? I, I, I need to keep this first for me. God says, no, give me the first. The first and the finest of the lambs belong to God. Put God first is the principle that He's telling His people. Give God first. It belongs to Him. And... That principle is really carried throughout the church. Remember the Bible tells us on the first day of the week. It's not Monday, it's Sunday. The first belongs to the Lord. We come and dedicate ourselves to our God. We give of our time. We give of our energies. We give of ourselves. We give of our finances. Uh, not a tenth, but as God has prospered you. Oh, you mean there's a building fund? You mean there's a bus fund? You mean there's missionaries? Oh, you mean there's uh, uh, all these other things I give to? Praise God for the giving of God's people. That's what happens when you give. You put God first. You see, Jericho was the first city to be conquered. God didn't burn, tell Israel to burn every city. But He did Jericho. And that's why the Bible tells us, you remember the story, when a Achan took, in chapter 7, we see he took of the accursed thing. 
He took of the accursed thing. In other words, Achan took what belonged to God. He, he saw some nice clothes. He saw, boy, I mean, look at these. I, I've been marching around in these old clothes. And he took some clothes and he took some other things and took them back to his tent and covered them up and hid them. I wonder if any of his family was watching. I wonder if his wife saw what he did or maybe his kids. Or, I, I don't know. We don't know. But you know what he did? He took of the accursed thing. It belonged to God. The first city was dedicated to God. It was to be uh, burnt as an offering to God. Well, let me say to you this morning, don't be too hard on Achan. Because sometimes we take of the accursed thing. You see, the Bible tells us what he says to the Corinthians. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? You are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. This body belongs to God. He bought it on the cruel cross of Calvary. God needs bodies to accomplish His will and do His purpose. And how dare we take of the accursed thing and say, I'm going to do with my body what I want. No, it's not yours. It's God's. It's God's. Not only that, and in your spirit, which are God's. And Paul would write uh, to the believers in, in Rome when he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now they understood a dead sacrifice. You take a sacrifice, you, put it, you kill it, put it on the altar, and depending on what kind of sacrifice, it's burned up. It speaks of dedication. But Paul says we're living sacrifices. As the old preacher said, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy. Young people, your body is holy. Don't scar it. Don't mar it. Don't fill your mind with trash. Don't fill your body with trash. Don't take it to trashy places and evil of this world. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And how sad it is when God's people take that which is dedicated to God uh, and it should be the Lord's, a living sacrifice, and we take it for ourselves. And then the faith of the people brought victory. Faith. Going back to our text in Joshua chapter 6, and verse 22. Listen to what Joshua tells us in, in his own words. And Joshua said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go up into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman, and all that she hath, as he sware unto her. And the men that were spies went in, and brought out Rahab and her father, and her mother and her brethren and all that she had and they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Now again, when you think of Rahab, listen to what she said in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 11. She, she's speaking to the spies. Here are these two men that have crept into the city. She saw them. She accepted them into her home and she hid them. And she said, As soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, for He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. 
I Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you should show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. And that ye shall save alive my father, my mother, my brother, and my sisters, and all that have deliver our lives from death. And the men said, Our lives for yours. If ye utter not this our business, and it shall be that when the Lord hath given us the land, that we shall deal kindly, truly with thee. And the men said, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and mother and thy brother and all thy father's house home unto thee. Now, I want you to imagine that you're Rahab. And you got your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters. I don't know how big her house is, but it's kind of like a, a family reunion, you know. And all of a sudden, they hear a shaking, a rumble. And they hear a huge crash. And Rahab looks out her window and she sees that a portion of the wall has fallen. And she sees the Israelites coming up. She runs and grabs the scarlet cord and throws it out the window. And that scarlet cord reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ that would flow from Calvary. As she would say, as I took the spies into my home, I took your God into my heart. And God would know that Rahab the harlot would be mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 in the Davidic line. And as she's there with her family, they're all huddled about and the kids maybe are crying. They hear screams and crying and things happening all around them. As 600,000 men of war are invading the city, destroying and killing cattle, men and women and, and everything around. And she says to her little niece, We're safe. We're safe. And the door swings open and maybe it's Caleb and said, here we are. Let's go. You see, salvation comes by faith. Rahab was saved by faith. Faith in the Jehovah God. She was delivered from destruction because she believed in their God. She believed in their word that they gave her. And that's the way we're saved. The Bible tells us there's destruction coming to mankind. The wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us, in fact, in 1 Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, when he says, To you who are troubled, rest with us, and when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey not the gospel of our G Lord Jesus, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. We're saved by faith, putting our faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, as Peter said, that cleanses us from all sin. We're saved by faith, just like Rahab was saved by faith. But then we find that we live by faith as well. It was faith that caused the walls to fall. It was faith that God gave them victory. Because they followed, you remember, God's formation, God's plan. The flesh was to be put to silence. And sometimes our old flesh rises up in our lives, doesn't it? It wants to say things we shouldn't say, go places we shouldn't go, do things we shouldn't do. But God said, oh, you got to suppress the flesh. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross daily. Had a young person tell me this week, you know, I finally realized 
That living for God is not just coming to the altar one time and saying, God, uh, I, I need victory and I want to I put you first in my life and die to self and get up and go back and never have to do it again. And, uh, no, Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. You get up in the old flesh, He follows you to work. He follows you home. He follows you to church even. And the world's out there. Then the foolishness of God is wiser than man. But God said to Israel, the first fruits belong to me. Are you giving God first? Are you making God a priority in your finances, your family, your time, your talents, your abilities? God said, the first fruits belong to me. And when you live by faith, I like the old song we sing, I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. My Lord, I know ruleth or everything, and all of my worry is vain. I'm living by faith. We're saved by faith, and we live by faith. We're not saved by works. We work because we're saved, and we want to show our love to God. It was June the 22nd, 1941. Remember Napoleon on June the 24th? That Hitler instigated his Operation Barbarossa, his invasion of Russia. It would be the largest in human history of soldiers thrown into combat. Again, as the Germans marched upon Russia, they were getting victory after victory. And the Russians, as you remember, put up a, a steep resistance. Steep resistance. But what was going to be weeks turned into months. And then lo and behold, the Russian winners hit. Hitler's soldiers and generals told him to take Moscow. That was the head. But Hitler said that was insignificant. Just destroy the army. Well, he did. He did. The Nazis captured 5 million men. 3.3 million starved to death. The German losses were one million. Nine, ninety thousand were captured by the Russians, Germans. Ninety thousand captured. That's not counting the, the losses. You know how many survived the prison camps, the Siberian camps? Six thousand. Around December the 5th to January the 7th, Hitler retreated. He didn't learn anything from Napoleon. Joshua the general has given us some wonderful lessons. Wonderful lessons to follow God's plan. Follow God's plan. Are you following God's plan? First of all, is, is plan for salvation, to know that you're saved. And then we must realize that uh, sometimes we must put to death the old flesh. He's your biggest enemy sometimes. I remember a professor told me uh, the world and the devil doesn't bother most Christians because the flesh and the world and the, is doing such a good job with them. The first belongs to the Lord. Faith comes by victory. Uh, what a wonderful lesson that Joshua has taught us. Would you bow with me in prayer? I don't know where you are in your life as far as your relationship with God. The most important need that you have is to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? 
Rahab was saved because she put out the scarlet cord to remind that victory would come not through her blood, but through someone else's blood. And I pray that you'll put your faith and trust in Christ today. We'd love to pray with you. And then maybe you are saved and you're struggling. Maybe you're struggling with the world. Maybe you're struggling with the flesh. Whatever it is, God can give you victory if you'll follow His plan. You can learn something from Joshua. Lord, I don't know what the needs are, but you do. So bring victory, salvation to the unsaved and victory to those that know Christ. Victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. So help us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.